Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and played. You're listening to The Owl and the Pussycat Went to Sea from the 1968 musical play of the same name with music and lyrics by British playwright and composer and lyricist David Wood. I was lucky enough to sit down with David to have a very detailed discussion about the art of writing plays and musicals for families, for children and a period spanning no less than five decades. This is my, Nick Hudson's, interview with David Wood, OBE. Am I really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why don't we get married? What? Well, I love you so much. Let's get married now. I'm in the presence of a, uh, a British theatrical god, I think I will call you. Uh, call <laughs> Good you. gracious me. <laughs> We are I'm, I'm the home, the museum of uh, David Wood. Hello, British playwright. Hello. Or you specialise in, in family theatre or children's theatre. Which one would do you, which line do you fall into? Well, it's a bit of both, really. But I would say, on, on the whole, if I'm known for anything, it's for working for children. And I suppose that's because for 40, whatever it is, years now, um, I've seen my role as writing for I suppose the primary age child that doesn't mean to say that sometimes things aren't suitable for slightly older ones but I I, I found a market some people say that I found my own niche quite early on the the wonderful thing is now that there are a lot of people who actually want to work in children's theatre they see it as a, a career both on the writing side on the designing side directing music everything uh, when I started, uh, I wrote my first children's play in 1967. Well, there were very few of us, put it that way. I mean, there were hardly any of us were doing it. Although there were shows like pantomimes and so on, which you could say were the equivalent, which were children's, yes, family, a bit, yes. There were the, the Wizard of Oz used to appear occasionally, Peter Pan, of course, but only in London when, I, when that started... Uh, would you normally see Peter Pan? There weren't that many productions um, up and down the country. It certainly wasn't a pantomime subject as it is now. Wind in the Willows, I suppose. There were a few versions of that. Toad of Toad Hall. There was a man called Nicholas Stuart Grey, who I think had probably finished by the time I started, and he used to write fairy tale type plays, which were done in London. Lyric Hammersmith, places like that. But the idea of children having their own theatre as a sort of genre of theatre was quite unusual. Uh, Unicorn theatre did exist and indeed uh, when I started they had been at the Arts Theatre for several years. Um, So one mustn't, you know, I certainly wasn't a a total pioneer. Uh, Richard Gill was already already running um, Polka but not as a building, he was running a, a touring company and there were, you know, there were a few pockets of activity, but not much. I wanted to bring children into the theatre. That was, for some reason, I got this bee in my bonnet that unless your parents actually took you to the theatre, you didn't really get the chance. And the school seemed to me to be the best vehicle. And I thought, one teacher can bring 50 or 100 children. Nowadays, it's it's very complicated because, of course, you have to have one teacher for every... I don't know, seven and a half children that you bring or whatever it may be. The regulations are terrifying and they're different in all parts of the country. Every local authority has a different regulation. In those days, I don't think it was quite so bad. But nevertheless, you know, you'd bring three or four teachers to look after 50 or 60 children. And I felt, well, uh, if we could convince the teachers that it was a good thing to go to the theatre and it, that it triggered the imagination of the children, that it gave them an experience, a communal experience, which was very different from the television experience. Um, if it was pu- educational with a small e, that would be good. But then I thought, well, any story which was had integrity or was coherent uh, probably would have an educational value. Anyway, that, that's really what was behind what I did. And, and I aimed at the primary school age 
simply because I thought they were the ones that needed it most and deserved it most and you, you need to get them early. Since then, of course, the, the, the picture worked, has actually. changed. Well, it did sort of work in, in the, it, to, a, to a limited degree. Um, by the time uh, I started Whirligig, which was in 1979, and Whirligig was my touring company, which John Gould and I ran for 25 years, under huge uh, problems, difficulties and so on, we, we, we got a bit of money from the Arts Council, but it wasn't regular funding. We had to apply, apply for project funding every year, which sometimes we didn't get. But we were playing in the biz- biggest theatres in the country. We, our London date was always Sadler's Wells, and we would be going to your Birmingham Hippodrome, Bristol Hippodrome, very big theatres. Um, we didn't have an office. We couldn't afford an office. Uh, we worked from our respective homes. And, um, uh, well, I remember Sadler's Wells telling us that we were the most efficient company ever worked in. It was only because <laughs> there was no room for confusion because <laughs> this whole thing of uh, something arriving in one office and not being seen by the person in the relevant office didn't apply. Plus, you can't be late for work. Absolutely. Not at all. And at the end of that 25 years, I, what I felt was that although uh, we, and we had reached a lot of children, there was no doubt about that, the, the achievement of the company was, was that we'd made people more aware of the benefits of doing work for children, not just the public and the schools, but also within the profession. Because what we found in the early days was that um, and it still exists a little bit, was that uh, children's theatre is seen really as second division theatre, not quite the real thing, and that therefore an actor who was working in children's theatre wasn't terribly proud of the fact <laughs> and would maybe um, keep it hidden from his peers. Uh, or uh, I'll give you another example, when you go to a West End musical and and you look at the programme and you looked at the biogs, uh, there are one or two people that will be in there who started in children's theatre and did uh, work for children for two or three years. And sometimes they don't actually mention that in their CV because they feel that, that, that you know, that uh, is, is not relevant because it's not terribly important and that people might uh, look down at them if they'd done children's theatre. That's, you know, I'm, I'm overstating it, but... It is true that it, when people have to cut down their biographies when they're told, oh, you've only got a hundred words like or something. They cut down casualty in the bill. But that's right, but they able. don't do that. They don't do that because they feel that it is more respected if you've been in a television soap or Dead whatever. Dead number two. Or, that, that exactly. Or, the great thing is that now you have this great diversity of work for children and young people. Uh, there's been a huge explosion in work for under fives, for instance, which I've, uh, I've, I've been part of to a certain extent. But there are wonderful companies like Oily Cart and Theatre Rights and Travelling Light in Bristol who do well, the Gruffalo is a big thing well. every Christmas. And, uh, well, that's right. And, snowman has um, always been a, a big the, Christmas. The Snowman, show. yes, that's for, that's. I think they probably saw that as for slightly older ones. They didn't see that as under fives necessarily. But uh, the Gruffalo, they certainly did. And your own Tiger that, who came to tea. That's right. Well, the, a Tiger who came to tea is put on by the same company as do the Gruffalo. And they came to me, and um, it wasn't my idea to do it. Although I have to say, my own children, it was our favourite book. I mean, in the house, it was the, it was it was hugely popular. But for some reason, I never thought of adapting it. Uh, but uh, Kenny Wax and uh, Nick Brook, Nick Brook in particular, was the one who really wanted to do it as a producer, and he got in touch with me. Well, it, actually, it wasn't as simple as that. It was <laughs> never is, is it? It was a strange story. Um, Two thousand and. Four, I think it was, or 2006. 2006, which is when it was the Queen's 80th birthday. And a year before, I had been approached by the BBC to write a play which was to feature iconic characters from children's literature, British children's literature, um, into a play uh, which would be performed uh, in Buckingham Palace Gardens on a Sunday... Uh, attended by 3,000 people, no pressure. which would include a couple of thousand children, um, and would have a lot of starry people and so on doing it. And it would be televised live on BBC One uh, on the afternoon of this particular Sunday. It was an extraordinary experience. It was not an easy experience, and it was sometimes a rather painful experience, but it, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. How do you decide which characters to put in that? I mean, there are so... 
Um, it's a great opportunity to. That's that's right. I'm, I mean, I made great lists of iconic characters. Some of them were animals. Some of them were human beings. Some of them were fantasy characters. Some of them were um, like the famous five, um, uh, sort of a children, fairly um, straightforward. But uh, when I came to write a storyline, I mean, the, the basic storyline was that the Queen had decided to hold a party at Buckingham Palace. So I took the real idea. Um, and uh, the BFG was living at Buckingham Palace because at the end of the book, in fact, uh, I've never admitted this before, but at the end of the book, he actually is invited to live at Windsor Castle by the Queen. But I pretended that it was Buckingham Palace. Not having him living here. Uh, (laughs) He's too big. (laughs) That's right. But I imagined, well, if the BFG is still living there and also Sophie from the BFG is still living there, this is quite a thought. Sophie uh, is really Sophie Dahl, who 20 years on from the writing of the book or more, um, has become Sophie Dahl, the supermodel. And I, I know so- Sophie because when I adapted the BFG, um, she was about 14 and a very similar age to my elder daughter and they got to know each other. And, uh, and of course, she came to see the show. So anyway, I thought oh, that would be quite fun. Sophie, grown up, is still living at Buckingham Palace. And the Queen asked her to help with the invitations for the party. And they have the Harry Potter lot come in and do cutaways or something? <laughs> well, no, it was a bit more complicated than that, really. No, the idea was that um, they invited, apart from the children coming, but they invited all the characters. Uh, and the problem was, was that they didn't know whether to invite the baddies or not. The Captain Hooks, the Aunt Spiker and Aunt Sponge. The Grand High Witch. Um, that, the Grand High Witch. And in the end, they didn't invite them. And of course, they were very miffed not to be invited and decided to try and wreck the party. And this involved them uh, doing dastardly deeds. And also, which was an important part, the Queen, this is real now, the, the Queen in reality had agreed to do a speech at the end. She would come on at the end and talk to the audience and, of course, everybody at home via the television screen about the importance of children's literature and the fact that she wanted to celebrate it on her 80th birthday. So I had this thought that um, maybe uh, if she didn't have her glasses with her, she wouldn't be able to read the speech, which would be in her handbag, along with the glasses. So I had the idea that Burglar Bill might be um, uh, encouraged by the other baddies to steal her handbag. Well, now this involved great um, uh, discussions with the palace and the Queen in the end agreed that her real handbag, complete with her real glasses and the speech, uh, would be given by a lady-in-waiting to a stage management person. The lady-in-waiting would actually accompany the stage management person and stand in the wings <laughs> holding the handbag, which would then be deposited in Burglarville's sack, which would then be brought on stage, and at a relevant moment it would be uh, uh, recovered uh, by Harry Potter uh, and co., and Tracy Beaker would actually hand it back to the Queen when she arrived for her speech, and uh, it would, uh, and Burglar Bill would have been caught and told he was a naughty boy or whatever. And all that indeed happened. I mean, it was very exciting because <laughs> this actually happened. Uh, uh, the problem with Harry Potter was that, um, along with several of the other characters, uh, particularly um, Winnie the Pooh, J.K. Rowling and, and um, Disney said no. Well, it wasn't as simple as that, but the copyright holders, the story went round that the copyright holders were all falling over themselves to cooperate for the Queen's birthday. And indeed, it wasn't that they were uncooperative. It was just that it was so different from anything they'd experienced before. So to give you an example, um, I wanted um, the three bears to be looking for the handbag. And my three bears were to be Winnie the Pooh, Paddington and Rupert. The Paddington people, as it were, said, yes, fine, Paddington uh, can be involved. Uh, The Rupert people and the Daily Express said, yes, fine. Uh, Winnie the Pooh is owned by Disney. And, uh, well, when I tell you that um, the head of uh, a rights department flew from Los Angeles to London specifically to talk to me about this, 
and because you uh, don't do phones. Um, but it was extraordinary. I mean, you know, it would have been so easy to do it by email or whatever. But he asked for information. And I told him everything, which he'd already been told anyway. And he said how difficult this was because never in the history of the world had one Disney character been seen in any other context but a Disney situation. They obviously haven't seen Roger Rabbit then. And, uh, well, we said, we said, look, come on, uh, Winnie the Pooh is British, for heaven's sake. No, you can't possibly... Uh, Did Disney, buy, Disney bought Winnie the Pooh, didn't they? The, they did, and um, in the sixties or something. That's right, and the Garrick Club have uh, made quite a lot of money out of it. Uh, I mean, in the end, they said that the only way in which my scene would work uh, would be not to have the three of them walking towards camera, looking for the handbag, which is what I wanted. It was a very quick scene, but just see the three of them together. Uh, they said it would be all right if. Um, uh, Winnie the Pooh was in his home territory in um, the, the, the whatever Hundred Acre Wood, Hundred Acre Wood, and uh, and the other two bears visited him, and there had to be a fence which they were the other side of, presumably not to con- contaminate Winnie the Pooh or something. And they had to advertise uh, the latest film. In the, in the... <laughs> no, no, they, oh no, none of that, none of that. But they, in other words, the two of them had to ask Winnie who. Uh, waved and said no I haven't seen the handbag and then they went away but they, they couldn't be seen alongside characters from another stable as it were um, so anyway that was what we had to do but as far as Harry Potter was concerned um, the problem was was that we <laughs> we'd agreed amongst ourselves the producers and so on that if we were representing these characters they had to be played by the people that knew uh, the, the, the people that every, everybody knew as. So Daniel Radcliffe would have to play Harry Potter. We couldn't have anybody else. Well, Daniel Radcliffe was doing his O-levels, I think, at the time, his GCSEs. And, uh, like he needs and it, those. it wasn't going to quite fit. And all that. But in the end, no, Warner Brothers were very good because they said that uh, instead, uh, although there could be no live appearances, uh, we could do a filmed insert where, which we could film on the Harry Potter set. And we could use the characters and that they would give us a day, uh, which is a lot of money in, in, in effect. And so a BBC crew went down. But it also meant that I had to write a script. I, I'm not the biggest Harry Potter fan in the world, <laughs> but you're, you're talking about the most recognisable characters probably in the world now. Mm. How, does it, how did it feel for you to sit down and write words well, without J.K. Tolkien, it, whatever it, name is, breathing down your it, neck? It wasn't a question of that. It was a question of um, uh, making quite sure that uh, everybody agreed with what one was doing, but also chipped in as well. So what I said was that I would write uh, um, the synopsis of the scene as to what had been going on up to that point and how they were going to magically find this handbag, the Queen's handbag. Um, And then I would like them to make the decision as to how we should do it. And, of course, they have lots of script writers on the films and so on. And it ended up with... um, a sort of collaboration and then J.K. Rowling herself rewrote the scene in the end which was very good of her but uh, I mean it was very good that she took the interest but at the same time of course she was very um, keen that nothing Harry Potterish should be seen which was not hers and I quite understand that uh, but that, and then it was shot so that no that was that was um, that was that was quite fun uh, but to go back to the tiger who came to tea which is where this rambling story started Uh, At the palace on that day, they had a reception for children's writers and they asked me to sort of host it, A, because I know a few of them, but also because uh, I think they wanted to keep me away from Trevor Nunn's rehearsals in the garden (laughs) because they thought I was uh, interfering a bit because changes had been made to my script. (laughs) I wasn't very happy. Uh, But uh, anyway, I was there to welcome these authors in and... uh, at one point, an elderly lady came in who I didn't recognise, and I, so I said, "Someone, who's that?" And they said, "Oh, it's Judith Carr, and who is the the creator, the writer, and illustrator of the Tiger Who Came to Tea." And uh, well, I went over to, to 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 welcome her, and I almost went down on my knees because that book was so popular in our household, 
And she completely took the wind out of my sails by saying, oh, thank you very much, said, and, uh, and my husband sends you his best regards. <laughs> and I didn't know who her husband was, hadn't got a clue. Um, and luckily she saw my confusion and said, oh, my husband is Nigel Neal. Now, Nigel Neal was the man that created Quatermass, which in the 50s and 60s was a huge television, live television drama about a monster and sort of science fiction. And uh, yeah, pre Doctor Who. And um, uh, the point was, which I found extraordinary, he had written some television plays, one of which I was in as an actor in around about 1970, 71. Uh, so you, it was 35 something years earlier. But he had remembered me and had obviously recognised the fact that I had slightly changed gear uh, and was writing and doing things. And he knew that I was writing this play at Buckingham Palace. He knew his wife was coming to the party and he was able to put two and two. He said, well, if you meet David Wood, say hello, which was lovely. Uh, so I had a long chat and she said, we must meet and you must come and see him. He'd love to see you because I hadn't seen him for all these years. Sadly, within a few weeks, he had died. And so the next time I saw her, um, uh, we did meet and we chatted and, uh, and she was very sweet. And she said, oh, um, she said, there is a producer who has shown interest in doing a stage version of Tiger. As a joke, really, I said, oh, well, if they want someone to write it, you know, tell them to give me a call. And it has been an absolute joy. Uh, it was a it was a labour of love to adapt it, and to write the songs for it, and so on, and then to actually direct it as well. It's a fifty five minute show with a cast of three, and uh, uh, it toured in two thousand and eight, uh, and um, it played uh, play uh, near London. It, came, it was at. Um, uh, Greenwich and uh, one or two other places and, and did reasonably well and then it came back again uh, in 2011 and did extremely well on tour and then it came into the vaudeville for a nine week West End season which was uh, really really lovely and we had a lot of reviews we had proper reviews because of course most children's theatre doesn't get reviewed by the main the critics the Times review was delightful and uh, and the business just went up and up and up and up so by the end uh, we were selling out, and uh, which means at the board of about 650. I'm about to direct it again for Christmas for the University of Warwick Arts Centre, and then it's going off to Singapore and Hong Kong and Dubai. And then next year we're doing another tour and it might come into the West End again. So it's been an absolute joy. And uh, going back again from these rambling stories, but what is interesting to me about it, quite apart from the fact it's been fun and it's worked and it's been um, uh, received well, is the fact that a show like that, for really aimed at under fives, would not have existed maybe uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, one would have been thinking a bit broader than that. Uh, or maybe that children of that age actually wouldn't get it anyway, and you'd be doing things for maybe 6 to 11. But we're now in a situation where the perception of things has changed over the years and children, although I don't believe children are actually more sophisticated, as people often say they are, children do know more younger. And so a show like My Gingerbread Man, uh, which uh, Gingerbread Man was written in 1976 and it was written for the Towngate Theatre Basildon, uh, one set, six in the cast, which was about right for the time. Cameron McIntosh and I had done a couple of uh, my shows before then. This was, you know, pre-Cats, or maybe Cats had opened by then, I don't know. It was certainly pre-Phantom and all the rest. But we decided, and uh, he liked it, Gingerbread, so he decided that we would bring it in to London for the following Christmas. And so it came into the Old Vic uh, for two Christmas seasons. 
And then it took off from there, and it's been wonderful for me. I mean, it's 35 years old now, and it's been paying the rent the whole time, really, because it was done in every single rep company in the country. It's still one of the most popular children's plays in Germany. It doesn't get done here as much, but in Germany, uh, there are always about eight or ten state theatres do it at Christmas time. Um, but that was very much, I would say, geared towards. Um, uh, primary school children I mean, maybe, maybe five, six up now if I wanted to revive it and bring it back I think that it would be perceived as for younger children and so it would almost be put into the under fives category it would be wrong to do that but at the same time I think that a lot of teachers and a lot of parents would look at it and say oh no my, my nine year old would be too old for that so Things have shifted over the years, and you have to sort of accommodate to that. Richmond Compton, who wrote, a, for listeners who don't know, she wrote a very famous um, book series uh, called Jess William, all the way from 1919 to 1969. And, and in 1969, she said, I feel my characters would have been a lot younger if I were to write it now. Mm. Do you think that makes sense? Or yes, I, th- I think television is responsible, and I don't mean that in a bad way, um, for people knowing more earlier um, and so that uh, the, the awareness of um, various issues various areas of life and so on um, they, they come into uh, a child's life much much earlier now I'm not really talking about this whole thing of um, the erosion of childhood and I mean there's a lot of talk about that uh, particularly well, at the moment since day one as well yes well that's right <laughs> and I think it's wrong to automatically assume that um, uh, childhood is completely changed partly because of the disintegration of the family unit uh, because people don't tell bedtime stories anymore uh, because schools have all this testing so they don't have time to do imaginative creative things with them and read them stories and so on you know all that I think I'm afraid is true but I don't think that explains totally why it is that um, uh, what we're saying is that you take a particular particular subject you see it's perception I'm talking about it's not the actual thing Um, I'll give you another example the perception of Paddington Bear I've never adapted Paddington uh, I was asked to at one, uh, at one point, but it, it, it didn't happen. But a few years ago, Polka Theatre did a, a production of Paddington. And in my opinion, a mistake was made. Uh, it was a very good adaptation, and it was a very fair adaptation of a number of the books. Uh, the Polka Theatre being the Polka Theatre for Children, which is in Wimbledon, which is a great institute for children's theatre says on the absolutely box, yes a, Sorry, a, just to clarify. A, a beacon a beacon of children's theatre um, and Michael Bond who wrote the Paddington books he he liked it very much he liked the adaptation and the production that they did the problem was was that the business wasn't very good the reason it wasn't very good was because in the adaptation of the books the content was actually for slightly older children than the perception of Paddington had become. The perception of Paddington now is that he's for under fives and it's the the, the Paddington uh, teddy bear uh, and it's the little books which they're beginning to do because they recognise that the perception has changed. They're now doing small books which are simpler stories. He does not represent the Paddington which Michael Bond wrote, which was really for everybody, but certainly not for under fives. I mean, it was for maybe nine, ten, eleven-year-olds, um, and and, uh, and and of course, parents liked it as well because they're quite um, they're, they're, the stories are, are fun for everybody. Um, but the story involved, for instance, um, the the Jewish next door neighbour um, who has a, a, a history and has various things in his suitcase and so on. And in the book, I mean, it's, it's really very moving indeed because the Holocaust is sort of mentioned and talked about. Uh, well, you wouldn't do that for under fives, really, because they wouldn't understand. Uh, but this was in the play. And what happened at Polka, sadly, was that the people that came to the play, on the whole, tended to be too young for it. And the ones for whom it was intended didn't come because... Not they themselves, but their parents or their teachers thought, oh no, um, Paddington, well, it's, that's, that's for the little ones. They're doing something for the little ones this year, which wasn't true. So 
this perception of, of, of children and sophistication and so on is, 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 a, is a problem, uh, but you just have to sort of cope with it, and, and it's all to do with the marketing, really. But I think that's what Stars and Drew did so well with Mary Poppins and Julian Fellows mm-hmm. as well, and Disney and Cameron McIntosh, is they made it for everyone. There were jokes for the adults, and it, it, that's hark back to pantomime and things, but Mary Poppins seems very special because it, it, it's just such a perfect taking of the movie elements, of the story elements, the things that the general public have ingrained into their craniums, you know, the images, and, and they put a, a very good production on stage no. for, for the family. You're, you're absolutely right. Well, let's talk about the difference between family and children's theatre, because uh, I think there is a difference, uh, and both have their virtues, and there's nothing wrong with either of them. Uh, by family theatre, talking in current terms, I suppose we're talking, yes, about Mary Poppins. We'll certainly be talking about Shrek. We'll be talking about Matilda. Lion King. Uh, the Lion King, yes. Um, They're all musicals, which is interesting. That, that is indeed interesting. A lot of them feature animals or there is a fantasy area. I mean, Shrek obviously has fairy tale characters in. Do you consider Wicked to be a family show? Um, I wouldn't, personally, no. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I think they would. I think the the management would, uh, and I think some people might well. But I don't see that as a family show in quite the same way. Um, the book certainly isn't a, a children's. Book. It isn't exactly, and I think that's probably partly why I f- I feel that it's. I mean, The Wizard of Oz is a family show, <laughs> but I don't think Wicked is. Matilda's also a phenomenal example of, I think it's the best show I've seen in, in an incredibly long time. I haven't seen it. Uh, but what I am very well aware of is the fact that it has a very, very broad appeal and is done on such a scale that uh, it becomes the type of show which can sit in a West End theatre for a long Millions time. Millions of years. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. My situation is that I don't believe that one can simply have a show on in the West End or even one that sometimes, you know, they go on tour. So uh, uh, The Sound of Music, you could say that's a family show. It's not, in my opinion, as family uh, orientated as something like Shrek or The Wizard of Oz, for obvious reasons. I mean, the, the, partly the, the, the fantasy element isn't there. It's very, think it's it has very real. It, it's... Exactly that. There are various elements, there are various ingredients, if you like, which make one think that it could be a family show. Children is one, animals is one, fantasy characters uh, is, is, is another. The fact that it's adapted from a children's book is another one too, because you don't necessarily find that a children's book automatically becomes a children's play. It might well become a family play. It sort of goes the extra uh, distance because it has the sort of legs that can, can go that distance. But my my position is, is that most of these shows that we're talking about, if you want to go and see them, you probably pay £65 a ticket and you probably find that there are no reductions for children. And you think, hang on, this is a family show, isn't it? Isn't it for children? Uh, shouldn't we expect it to be slightly cheaper for smaller people? And then, no, we can't do that because you know, they're very, very expensive shows to put on. And you think, OK, fair enough. And then you think, well, where are these shows happening? Well, they're very specific because some of them are so big that they have to be in the West End. And uh, indeed, if they do tour, they have to be honed down a bit and the production has to be slightly changed in order to be able to go into some of the provincial theatres. And so you suddenly realise that actually the number of people that can see these shows, yes, over a period of 15 years or something, is considerable, but it is not populist in a real sense because if you're living in Hartlepool or you're living in a part of the country which is not very near to us it's it's not fair to say oh you you must go and see that because a you couldn't afford to because you've got the train fare and the ticket I, I think it's a bit elitist to say that I mean I remember Michael Billington once years ago said that uh, uh, for, for you don't really need children's theatre but just take them to uh, cats or take them to a pantomime well okay maybe take them to a pantomime I mean some pantomimes are, are, are absolutely fine 
uh, for children and they get something out of them, yes, I, I don't doubt that. I'm, I myself was brought up on pantomime and I would agree with that. The problem with pantomime is that sometimes the story is rather overlooked. I mean, a lot of the pantomimes are much better these days because they've, I, th- I believe, picked up things from children's theatre whereby they've realised that children actually like a good story. Um, but nevertheless, they are broader entertainments because they have to entertain everybody. I still have this rather conservative belief that if we do something which is specifically targeted at children, we have more chance of really gripping them and bringing them in to what we're doing than even if they see something big and wonderfully spectacular, which is a family show. That does not mean to say that the lucky ones who are able to go and see Matilda or are able to go and see Mary Poppins don't get something out of it. And That's absolutely fine. I'm talking about the other ones who don't get that chance. And I know that there are theatres, the middle scale theatres and so on, who um, uh, can take in children's shows which are slightly smaller, well, not slightly, but considerably smaller in scale, which do a very valuable job in introducing children to the theatre. Now, um, Matilda is a very different um, uh, animal from the seven Roald Dahl adaptations that I have done. Because I was going to say, for me, you are synonymous with Roald Dahl. I saw The Witches on stage, Mm -hmm. which you did. Mm. And I saw the BFG on stage, which Mm. you did. I also remember seeing the giraffe and the Pelican and me. Pelican and me, that was, yes, Vicky Island adapted that for Polka. At the Polka Theatre. Yep. Um, So you you must have met Roald Dahl. No, the story there is that uh, I was asked to adapt the BFG. Again, it wasn't my idea. Two young producers came and they got the rights. And they said, would I do it? And I turned it down three times uh, because I didn't feel that it was possible. I had a feeling that it was a bit of a commercial um, ploy and that uh, they, the producers hadn't really thought about how difficult it was to convincingly put on stage something which children who loved the book would accept when talking about a 22-foot tall giant and a little girl, you know. Uh, eventually, I, I did find a way of theatrically doing it, which I think um, I like to think worked. Uh, but it it did take time. Um, but we put it on uh, in whenever it was, 1991. Now, I was writing it a few months before uh, in a hotel room in um, Hastings, <laughs> overlooking the sea. Glamorous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I started doing quite a few years before I wrote the BFG was uh, when my children were small, um, I found that I had to go away to actually write the play. It didn't mean to say I had to go away for planning it and thinking about it and all that. But uh, what physically, I like to do... Physically writing it. Keith. Physically writing it, I can do in maybe two or three days uh, without much sleep and, and not, not thinking of routines uh, for meals and everything. You know, uh, you go through the night if necessary and you don't, but you don't observe the normal patterns of life. And uh, uh, and I always liked writing by the sea for some reason. But certainly uh, I had written several plays in Brighton and then uh, I, for some reason I went to Hastings and did a couple. Uh, and I was... I have a rule because, again, there's, there's this whole thing and writers will tell you, you know, that they'd far rather go and make a cup of coffee or something you know, they, rather than actually do the work. And... Um, Mm. I have this rule whereby uh, I don't turn the television on in the hotel room, if there is one, uh, until I've finished, uh, because it's far too tempting, you know, to do that. So uh, I was working away on the BFG and I'd got to the helicopter bit, which is quite near the end, and I was quite pleased with myself, I think, and I thought, oh, it was about quarter past six in the evening, and I thought, oh, I'm going to give myself a treat. I I turned the telly on. So it was the first time I'd watched the telly for at least two or three days. And it uh, it was the sort of television that warms up. (laughs) It doesn't come straight on. (laughs) And the first thing that I heard was a newsreader, BBC News, saying, literally the first words he said were, uh, it was announced that Roald Dahl died earlier today. Uh, which was extraordinary. It was a very Dahl-esque moment in my life, which I shall never forget, because it was such a coincidence that it should be at that moment. And I remember sitting there in the gloom um, as, as, as the evening carried on and the room got darker and darker, 
uh, worrying, A, that maybe they wouldn't uh, allow us to do the adaptation. I thought, well, maybe there'd be a reason for that. Um, but then I thought, well, no, because if they'd given the rights, I'm sure it'll be all right. But then I thought, well, it's it's sad in a way. This is all very selfish, of course. I wasn't thinking of poor old Roald Dahl. But I was, <laughs> I was thinking, um, what a shame he won't be able to see it uh, when it's done, uh, which, of course, he never did. Uh, the great thing was that the family did see it and they did like it. And as a result of which I was given permission to do the witches and then I've done the, 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 the six more. But um, at, at, at the family, to be absolutely honest, I mean, um, Tessa Dahl, that's uh, Sophie's mother, uh, did say to me once that I was very lucky that uh, Dahl had died when he did. <laughs> And I said, oh, really, why? So she said, well, she said he hated ed- everything that yes, anybody I mean, ever I, did to I, his I, stuff. I, I, I was going to say, and, and I was thinking it might sound quite rude, and when you said you know, he wouldn't get to see it, and I thought, well, he'd probably hate it anyway, because he... Mm, well, that's, that's exactly right. And so she said, you know, uh, the fact that he died when he did means that he wasn't able to see what you did, but we happen to like it, and that's why, you know, you've gone on and, and done other things. And but, but, it could well be that's true. But you're saying Matilda's a different beasts entirely. Matilda is a different beast simply because um, the the scale of it is that much greater. What I'm trying to do is to tell the story as faithfully as I can. Uh, and I'm not saying they're not with Matilda, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm trying to do it in, uh, not in a straitjacket, but I know that if I uh, were to be so inventive and I had to have all sorts of uh, stuff flying in and trucks blazing all that it wouldn't really get done i don't think it would get done uh nowadays it might be because dahl has come up again you see but then um he wasn't as well known as he is now so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens when um, matilda has been on a year or two they do say that the Drury Lane is going to be a big musical of a new musical of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, who wrote Hairspray and things like that. So. Well, w- w- what I do know is that the new Charlie musical has been in preparation for some years. I think I'm right in saying that Sam Mendes is involved. However, having said that, there is a com- might be a confusion there because there is a big James and the Giant Peach in preparation too. There's a big musical based on that. What this quite what, what this will mean as far as my stuff is concerned, I'm not sure. Uh, what I can tell you, I mean, it's no secret, is that um, there's been an embargo put on uh, on my shows while Matilda is on. Uh, my shows can't be done within a certain radius of London while Matilda is on. Uh, oh dear. I've got well, it is. It's a it's a shame in a way, but uh, it's not stopping. I mean, there there are two BFGs this Christmas: one at Lancaster Dukes and another at Derby uh, Theatre. There is a new uh, tour of my James and the Giant Peach, which will be opening in the autumn next year, which is Birmingham Stage Company, and that will tour for at least a year. Um, and if it can't come within a certain radius of London, it won't. But the rest of the country is bigger than London anyway. Well, that's so. right. That's right. If uh, James and the Giant Peach, the brand new musical, came in, I'm not quite sure what they'd do. What they can't do is completely um, uh, ban all productions of my dolls. Uh, they can, the professional ones, technically they could do that if they wanted to. Um, but there'd be a problem with the amateur ones because the deal with Samuel French would have to be um, scrubbed out. And I'm not quite sure how you do that. Uh, but my contention is, to be honest, that um, uh, the scale of my version of most of the doll, dolls, which is able to be done in theatres where there is no way you could do Matilda, I think that will mean that they will hopefully survive a, a bit. I mean, other people may come along and do them and they may, may be given the rights and the, and the dolls have every right to give other people the rights to do it. But... What I would like to think is, is that mine will continue to be done in those places where uh, they can only do the scale of play that I have written. Um, uh, and it's, it's like, I don't know, um, there must be other examples of where there is the, the biggie, as it were, um, and there are other shows which are similar or or whatever but they are smaller scale and can be done i mean certainly again we know that 
a big musical like Matilda, maybe in 20 years' time, the amateur operatic societies will be doing it. They'll be doing it differently. They will have scaled it down somehow, and I'm, all that will happen, I'm I mean, sure. Phantom has just been announced that he's releasing the rights for well, Dan that's for right. 25 years. So. Absolutely. It will happen in just the same way as, you know, people started doing Ivan Novello uh, years ago, and, or and, and Rogers sad- and Hammerstein, and, and so on. And, and mm. sadly, I think... Um, as charming a piece as Betty Blue Eyes was, I think that's much more suitable for amateur rights and community theatres because it's it's a great... There's no... It's about a community, that show. So, I think um, you're right. I think that... Uh, I certainly think that Betty Blue Eyes has a considerable future um, uh, in, anyway, but I think it has a considerable future in the um, community amateur market uh, because I think it's just the sort of show that they're looking for and they don't want to always do the Rise same old ones. Things. That's right. Um, my, 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 no, I think it'll fit very well into them into that market. My question for you, and I've always wondered this, why is there no musical of the witches? Um, do, do you think it would work as a musical? Because <clears throat> one of the best songs is written in it already. I mean... Yeah, it, it might well... It, uh, Yes, I mean it might well um, work as me. It's like any of them. I mean, you know, there's how no, you do it, isn't it? There, yes, there, there there are some people who've been working on a musical. I think of the BFG in America, um, and there are people who you know. I've been very I've been very lucky with the dolls because uh, people have been falling over themselves to try and get the rights. Uh, and I again, I don't think it's any secret that. Uh, between 15 years and 20 years ago, I don't know, 15 years ago maybe, um, Styles and Drew and I worked on Matilda. Uh, I did not know that. Mm, well, we, we spent some time working on Matilda and we did um, a structure and some scenes and some songs. They wrote some very nice songs for it. And we did a presentation for the dolls and all the agents and everything and uh, they decided not to go ahead. They didn't want us to, to do it. Um and over the years, I mean, obviously, Styles and Drew, uh, Honk came along, and, um, uh, and and Mary Poppins and several other uh, shows. And we have regularly gone back to the dolls and said, you know, we're still interested. And meanwhile, I was doing other dolls as well. Uh, but they always held on to Matilda, and I think they they were hanging on uh, for a big one as a big big musical. And uh, you could say that they their judgment was right, you know. So that's absolutely fine. But no, we we we, we did work on it. Uh, but as far as the witches is concerned, um, I'll do the witches with you. That's my <laughs> <laughs> well. It's horses for courses. It's it uh, as far as stories are concerned. It's funny because when I was asked to do the BFG. I was given a free hand, really. I mean, I knew I couldn't do it with a cast of more than eight or ten or something like that. Uh, the, the, the financial um, side of it, uh, the, I knew would be tricky because the seat price had to be relatively low because that was going to be touring and it was going to have a lot of schools' performances and you can't have it uh, too, too high a seat price. And that undoubtedly, in a commercial situation as this was, affects the budget and affects the way you do things. But it wasn't that that made me stop doing it as a musical. There is, there's an early synopsis where I think I actually was um, positioning a few places for songs. Uh, because you're composing lyricist yourself. Well, that's right. And I would, yeah, I'm, I, I have this sort of slight luxury in a way whereby... Um, ever since I wrote my first children's play in 1967 I've allowed myself the luxury of writing my own songs Um, occasionally I've worked with somebody else but very very rarely now you could say that's a bad thing (laughs) you could say that they would be much better if someone else did them but we have made the occasional album the album of Pussycat went to sea there was a lovely album with Harry Seacombe and uh, Roy Castle on it I've always enjoyed writing songs I've ever, and uh, and certainly for um, uh, Gingerbread Man and so on it's, it's been I don't know a lot of people talk about collaboration you know on musicals and so on the fact that you're working with several people I hate arguments I hate confrontation and one of the things I can honestly say that with my children's shows is, is that I have arguments yes but the arguments are with myself because I'm doing book music and lyrics so it's entirely my fault it's entirely my baby and the result of that is I find that I do argue with myself but I always win 
<laughs> and that's for good or bad. But I don't have a situation where someone is fighting for the book and someone is fighting for the lyrics and saying, oh, but we can't say that. We've got to do this here and there. And the musician is saying, oh, no, no. And I've, as an actor, I've been in musicals where I've experienced all this heartache that goes on. And uh, sometimes I do direct them myself, though, as well, I have to admit. But uh, <laughs> uh, Gingerbread Man is a case in point where um, I ended up directing it. I mean, the first, the first um, uh, Gingerbread Man was directed brilliantly by Jonathan Lynn, who later wrote Yes, Minister, and has just written the, the play in the, in the West End and directed it. And Jonathan, round about that time, I'd known him since I, I was at Oxford and he was at Cambridge, and he... Uh, was in review and so on and I was in review and we knew each other and uh, I asked him to direct The Plotters of Cabbage Patch Corner which was an early children's play of mine and he said oh god why on earth me he said I don't even like children he said I haven't got children why on earth ask me and I said that's the whole point I said I want you to take it seriously as a play and not patronise in any way and he directed it brilliantly uh, it was at the Shaw Theatre the first Christmas show ever at the Shaw Theatre uh, Julia McKenzie was in it before people had really heard of her she was a wonderful ladybird Bridget Turner great actress was uh, green flag it was a very very good cast and um, and it came back the following year so anyway a few years later when I did Gingerbread Man I asked Johnny to direct it uh, which he did at Basildon and then he directed the, the old Vic one and then I took over from him and I've directed it about 15 times in London and elsewhere since but I can honestly say that really I've been doing his production because I've very, I, I've hardly changed um, what he did. So sometimes, you know, I do do it all. Um, but as far as the BFG was concerned, um, yeah, there were a few places for songs. But the more I thought about it, I thought, no, actually, I'd rather not. I'd rather keep it as a play. Um, there'll be music because there's always incidental I remember music. The, I remember the keyboardist when I yeah, went to see it yeah. doing all those magnificent sounds in 1993. Or That's right. Well, we had a, a we had a, a synthesizer type thing making a few noises and uh, and, the, and the keyboard. Cliff Atkinson, I think that it would have been doing that one. He did several of us of them, and it was terrifying. You know. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> no, certainly um, a lot of people. Who was it the other day? was remembering uh, the, the giants in the BFG and remembering that there was a lot of red light around and that it was really quite frightening. And this, was, this is someone who's become a director. The one thing I remember was a face gliding through a window, or not through a window, but across a window. That's the Ooh. one memory I have of right. the BFG as he walked past the yeah. Palace. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, looking through. Um, yes, that was probably a big cutout or something that uh, just to show him looking through the. No, it was his window. face. It was, yeah, it's it was a real face. person. It was a real. Fa- oh, was it really? No, no. <laughs> in, in my mind, as in a, your mind, as yes. a young child, that was the, the BFG <laughs> because that was Roald Dahl, wasn't it? I mean, he he he, he himself was six foot seven or something, and he had a mm. cane. And yes, I mean, the, we could have a we could have a long long uh, uh, debate about this. Uh, in fact, he he based the character on a man called Wally, who was uh, a kind of odd job man who worked for him uh, at Gypsy House uh, and was a friend of the family. And there was some other connection. I'm not quite sure what that was. I've forgotten, but it's in the bi- the biography. Um, and Wally was very tall and he had a slightly strange way of talking, which I think gave Dahl the idea of doing the, um, the, the, the nonsense language, uh, which is a very important part of the BFG. Uh, having said that, I think you're absolutely right in that Dahl thought of himself as the BFG and would uh, liked to put himself into the BFG's shoes. And when he's first mentioned, of course, which is in Danny the Champion of the World, if you read Danny the Champion of the World, the first few chapters, uh, Danny's father... Uh, they live in a caravan and uh, Danny's mother has died some years earlier but Danny's father tells Danny stories about the big friendly giant and uh, he was eventually persuaded because he had been telling these stories to his own children so but he was eventually persuaded to develop it into the full length book and I think if you'd said to him uh, who of all your characters do you most identify with? Grand High Witch. Uh, well, he would have probably... <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite interesting, actually, because there are elements of him that might well have said that. Uh, but I think that he, in a nice way, would like to be thought of as, um, as, as the BFG, if not the total prototype. 
Um, I think that the BFG was probably his favourite book of the ones that he wrote. Uh, I think that um, it would be fair to say that, uh, but you know, one 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 doesn't really know. But the, uh, the the fact that he put Sophie into it, and it it really is Sophie because in those days she wore glasses, and of course Quentin Blake in the famous illustrations made it look like her. Um, I think it was a very personal book, um, and and it certainly it's interesting because. I think it's my favourite, uh, and it, and people often say, you know, which is your favourite, and and it's difficult to 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 be sure of these things because it was the first one I did. There's that automatic feeling that the mm. first one you have a soft spot for, but I actually do think that it's as a as a, a book, it probably is my favourite. See, um, the others have extraordinary qualities. I mean, the uh, uh, the, the twits is is wonderful in its grotesqueness and children absolutely love it um, and I think it's fun because uh, of, the, of the animal content the way the animals are used which is very different from some of the other books uh, but then James and the Giant Peach I mean you could say that that is uh, you know, a lot of people would say that was their favourite the one I was never the one I was never keen on was Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator I always thought it was really mm. weird. <laughs> yes, well, it was a sort of sequel, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, I I always I have a difficulty, and this isn't just sour grapes because I've never been allowed to adapt Charlie. Um, the history of Charlie, incidentally, is that um, it was adapted for the stage. Um, uh, there were there were two manifestations, as it were. One is that this man um, uh, Ronald George. Uh, is it Ronald George? I can't remember. Uh, but uh, Richard George, beg your pardon, Richard George. He is uh, an American school teacher who sent uh, to Dahl a script that he'd written in the hope that Dahl would like it for, and allow him to do with his school. And um, Dahl was, I think, probably flattered by this because it hadn't happened before and gave permission and eventually suggested that it should be um, published. And indeed, that is the version that P uh, Penguin or Puffin uh, still publish uh, of um, uh, James uh, of Charlie and James because he did James and the Giant Peach as well uh, but Charlie was also done uh, in this country uh, I think Jeremy Raisin actually adapted it and a producer called Armand Gerard uh, put it on and had a lot of success with it on tour over a period of years this would be back in the 70s, I should think, and maybe into the 80s. Uh, I know it was done at Sadler's Wells, probably once or twice, but it was on tour a lot. Um, and uh, I think there was there were songs in it. And uh, uh, the story goes, and uh, and I will say that it's a story because I've never absolutely had it confirmed by the the, the, the various parties themselves but the story goes that it was suddenly discovered that the whole thing was totally illegal and it stopped the, and the, it was nothing to do with Armand Gerard the producer who had acted extremely honourably he had gone to uh, Murray Pollinger who was Dahl's agent Dahl the, uh, in his lifetime didn't have a play agent he, he had a book agent obviously and Murray Pollinger allowed this Charlie uh, and the Chocolate Factory to go ahead. Um, we don't know, uh, or I don't know, whether Dahl actually liked that one or not, or whether he saw it even. Probably not. Probably not, I don't know. But it was allowed to go on for a number of years. What Pollinger hadn't realised was that the deal that had been struck with Warner Brothers for the film, uh, not the obviously the the Johnny Depp one, but the earlier one, the Gene Wilder one, um, and Leslie Brookes. Uh, that's right, Willy yeah. Wonka and Chocolate Factory, whatever. Um, the deal with that gave the stage rights to of Warner the Brothers. book to Warner Brothers, and for a long time, and it was something strange, like thirty-seven years. It had obviously been negotiated, but it was a long time. So, in fact, this version 
uh, had been totally illegal. Uh, it's still, I think, in print. I think Samuel French published it, and I don't know whether you are allowed to do it ever. But meanwhile, there is another version that was written within the last five, six, seven years, which the Dahls allowed to happen. Is this the opera? The which, um, well, no, there's, a, that, there's that one, but there's also the Leslie Brickus one, where he wanted to do a stage version, which particularly could be done in schools, using the songs from the film. And they, th- that is available. You can do that. But otherwise, anybody who asks to do a stage version of Charlie uh, gets turned down, except that now, as you said earlier on, there is this huge Broadway musical version in preparation. Obviously on the success of the film. Of, I would of, say of so, the, the fact that it's had a renewed uh, success, renewed interest. It's funny, I have never liked, if I'm honest, the story of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory as much as some people... Uh, it's I think very I would, disturbing. Well, it is disturbing. I would find it very difficult to adapt, I think, because all these children and the things that happen to them and the nastiness of the children, I don't know. Uh, children love it, and I mean, one can't knock that. Children actually love the, uh, the, the cruelty of it. Uh, but I think it, I would find it difficult to visualise that and actually put it on in front of... It, it, I had a similar problem... Um, to begin with, with the twits. You just ring Paul Keeve up and say, I uh, need a guy to be sucked <laughs> through a tube and blown up and things. Yeah, and- oh, I, yes, I don't mean technically so much, but just the notion of what you're doing to people, which is different on the printed page from when you actually see it, I think. And in the twits, Mr and Mrs are really very, very unpleasant to each other. And of course, they're very unpleasant to the, um, to the, the, the muggle wumps, the monkeys as well. But... I spent a long time thinking, how on earth can we get this relationship between Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Twit so that it's funny? Because it's funny in the book, even when they're hitting each other and they're doing nasty things with, his, with her stick and he's cutting it down, all sorts of horrible things. It took a long time before... In, I, I read it many, many times, and suddenly I found this line, which I seem to have missed every other time I'd read it, which is one line which is only said once in the book and it's never picked up anywhere else. And it says, Mr and Mrs Twit once worked in the circus. And I suddenly thought, that's it. Um, We can do it as a circus idea whereby it's a sort of slapstick. They're almost like clowns. And if we actually have a circus ring in the middle of the stage and we change the lighting when they go into one of their routines where they're nasty to each other, we can do it in a theatrical way which won't involve them having to necessarily hit each other uh, for real, which wouldn't be funny. I mean, I don't think people would find that funny, whereas they would find a slapsticky, clowny type... Uh, arrangement quite funny so um uh it may be that with charlie that one might do it in in a, in a similar way rather than doing it naturalistically but uh, as i'm never ever going to be allowed to do charlie then it's not worth really um uh, considering too much <laughs> i still think the witches would be a wonderful idea for a musical because uh... well it could well be yes it could well be my problem i, t- I tell you what my problem is that I believe that in a children's play, now I perhaps believe this for a family play as well, I just feel that on the whole, songs should be there to progress the action rather than to comment on it or to divide it up. Or any musical. Well, yes, one says that, but it's amazing how many times there are songs, sometimes the most successful songs in a musical, which actually, by the end of the song, you are no further forward in the story than you were when it started. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, particularly in an adult musical. But with a children's thing, somehow action is very important and keeping the story going is very important. So the sort of songs that I've always liked are songs where, um, I mean, you know, supposing in I mean, in the plot is of Cabbage Patch Corner where uh, some of the insects have been caught in a flower pot with a sticky spy- spider's web and they have to escape. And there's a song which is just called One, Two, Three or something. And, and, and it's very tippy-toe. One, two, two, step three. One, two, one step, two, step three. Soon we'll all be free. And things go wrong as they're going on because the web suddenly falls down again. A little bit. But you see what I mean? I mean, it, 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 by the end of the song, they're out. And it seems that uh, a song like that um, has more chance of grabbing the child's attention uh, and holding it 
rather than, as we all know, I mean, they, they, they go to the other extreme, when the prince and the princess or something in the pantomime sing the love song, you know, we know that the children sort of turn off, uh, unless, of course, it's being sung by two current uh, heartthrobs um, who are singing a current song from the charts. I mean, that may make a big difference. But on the whole, if you have a ballad uh, of... of um, even with you know buttons or Prince Charming going to Cinderella, and it's a, a conventional, straightforward bat. You can be pretty sure that that's when some of the children will decide they want to go to the loo. That's what Spamalot did very well in. Um, yes, with the, the song that goes like this. The song that goes like absolutely this. Absolutely naffle, but you mm. know, it, absolutely. It's as though you know we have to do it. It's expected of us, and the grown-ups like it, and so on. But the, but in fact, the the, the, the children don't really. Um, and so, whenever I look at a thing. Um, that I'm considering adapting or I've been asked to adapt, uh, I try to find ways of making songs work. And if I can't feel that they will necessarily or that the story is too important to keep on it, then I don't do it. Well, and also there's nothing wrong with having one song in a, in a, in a play, you know. A, a... That is absolutely true. No, that, you're absolutely right about that. Um, uh, there was a play of mine, an original play, not an adaptation, called The Selfish Shellfish, which was all about a, an oil slick invading a rock pool and there are I think two songs in there and the position they come in and what they're saying there's another one called the seesaw tree too about a tree which is going to be chopped down sort of conservation play and the songs are so important because one of them is a protest song but it's the is the poor creatures that live in the tree saying don't please don't chop our tree down as well um, and so, yes, very specifically placed. I agree with you. I think that that can work very, very well. Especially for um, kids, because it wakes them up in a way. Yes, know. that's true. Now, in, in my James and the Giant Peach, I very deliberately wrote in rhymes, uh, a lot of which are Dahl's own, and I edited them. And I, there were one or two instances where I had to do a couple of my own rhymes to, uh, to, to, to fill a gap or whatever. And what I said was in the um, uh, opening of the published edition was that these rhymes could be looked on as songs. On the other hand, they needn't be songs. They could well be spoken. They could be chanted. They could be um, yeah. used in, in, in whatever way. Now, the, 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 by giving every company that does it permission to write their own music you could say is dangerous because they could write some terrible but but what it also means is that there isn't a standardized version and many composers some of them really rather well known who have done my james and outpeach and have provided the music for it have written to me and said would samuel french and you consider you know promoting my version?" and i've always said no because what i love is when they 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 come up with their own solutions and you have a, a the, the San Diego Youth Theatre, for instance, did a wonderful production where they did it, it in rap. So all the all the rhymed stuff all the, was was done in rap. A, it was very clear because they didn't make it dense or anything mm. or, or make it too difficult to hear with the rhythm going on behind it. You heard every word, which sometimes you don't when they're sung, if we're honest. Um, but B, it was in their sort of. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they 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 felt that it was part of their culture and what they wanted to do. Um, other people, I mean, I, uh, Jason Carr wrote a very good score for it, which was done by the Chichester Youth Theatre at Chichester Festival Theatre one Christmas with a cast of 70. Uh, and there was some lovely stuff in that. I do feel that in a way, I don't want to... Uh, inhibit people from doing these things. That's fascinating. Just, I mean, the thought of just providing lyrics to a theatre company and saying, mm. "Do what you want." I mean, it, it it's great if kids are involved as well because it means they can become part of the creative process. Absolutely so right. That's, that's genius on your behalf. So, well, well, I don't know. It's laziness, really, maybe. But, but no, I do love it because when I go and see a new production, um, I never know quite what to expect. And sometimes uh, they, they, they mix and match. And so there's a song which is my lyric um, called Wonderful Things. And, uh, and it's the old man, the, the rather sinister old man who comes in and uh, gives James the crocodile tongues, uh, which lead to all the magic happening. And um, 
Uh, and that's been set in all sorts of you know, wonderful yeah, you can imagine all that sort of thing sometimes in waltz time because actually when you say it it feels a bit waltzy but one of the best productions I ever saw it was spoken and it was yes there was an underscore going on but uh, it was it was deliciously sinister even though it was saying nice things mm. <laughs> and and I thought that the, the spoken uh, version told the story, if you like, of what the song was about better than if one was singing wonderful and you had this rather nice voice saying it when, in fact, what one wanted to, to do was to make the child sit on the edge of its seat, not quite sure whether this uh, character is a, a goodie or a baddie or a nice whatever, you know. So, it's, no, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> well, David Wood, thank you very, very much for... You've completely changed my views on theatre forever. <laughs> rubbish, rubbish. In the space of an afternoon. But th- <laughs> thank you very much for talking to us. Where can people go to find out more information about your life? Uh, well, there is a website, of course, and uh, um, that's at uh, www.davidwood.org org.uk I think there's probably a bit too much on it now because I, I keep on sticking things on it uh, <laughs> but um, the, the, uh, the, the, I've written so many of these wretched plays that um, uh, I thought it was a good idea to list them and to list uh, the ones that can be done and how they can be done Samuel French handled most of them but there are a certain number of plays I mean they're, they're, I've had these odd sort of excursions into the adult world as well and uh, so the Rock Nativity although that, that's a sort of family one really that I wrote with Tony Hatch many years ago um, that's published by Weinberger so that the website sort of helps by pointing people in the right direction and uh, and of course my current one which is a, the grown up one the go between uh, which is been on at West Yorkshire Playhouse and is going to be at Derby and at um, Northampton which has been very exciting working with Richard Taylor the composer um, on a grown up thing for the first time for about 35 years <laughs> and, and suddenly having to go to evening shows I suddenly, I suddenly realised we were in the interval the other day and I thought I'm a bit tired and I thought is it because of my the strain and the worry past my bedtime <laughs> but it's past my bedtime because I'm used to mornings and afternoons for shows but um, no it's been a pleasure thank you very much indeed for talking to me and, um, uh, and good luck with all your future ventures both uh, on this website and elsewhere my thanks go to david wood there for taking a good deal out of his day to talk to me thank you very much david uh, lots of great stuff coming up in the future of a musical talk we're discussing matilda very soon and crazy for you and we've got some very lovely episodes of a christmas for you that are not festive at all which will uh, be absolutely delightful and quite ironic this episode has been a production of Musical Talk, copyright 2011, it's set with the songs, where the copyright persists with the original creators. It was presented and edited by Nick Hudson. Bye. Yes. The recite of the trumpety tree, Kim Stork and Duck and Grouse, and the snail of the bumblebee. They all said you had makes a lovely house. And the bubble with the rascal toes, the frog and the misky bat, and the dog with the luminous stone. We all bring the horns on the quangle's hat. So the longer he lives by the trumpety tree, the plainer than ever he seems to be. Yet now every hour he comes this way, and the clank of a moss will ride to get to the quangle, quangle tree. There is a TV moment. Um, our, my very good friend and our, one of our presenters, uh, TV's Jonathan Cohen. Oh, he, uh, what? Yeah. He mentioned to me last night, he did something with roller skates. <laughs> oh, that's very unfair. No, well, that was when I was on Play Away. Um, and with with him, I was a, I was a, I wasn't a, um, a total regular on Play Away, but I was a regular in the sense that I did about four or five programmes a year. And... Um, this script came in <laughs> which had been written where we were all on roller skates except Jonathan who of course was seated at the piano as usual and I said I, before rehearsal with him I said I, I'm sorry but I, there is no way that I can do this I have tried over the years to roller skate I can't do it and it would be a waste of everybody's time